Emily Chang, and this is the best of Bloomberg Technology, where we bring you all our top interviews from the week in tech. Coming up, mutiny inside the world's most valuable startup, why investors decided it was time for Travis Kalanick to go, and the way forward for Uber. Plus, Sheryl Sandberg opens up in a Bloomberg exclusive interview. The Facebook COO gives us her take on big branding, the future of digital ads, and cybersecurity. And the inside track on the Trump administration's plans for tech. We talk with the founder of Code for America, who was in the room alongside tech's biggest heavyweights for the first meeting of the American Technology Council. But first, to our lead. Travis Kalanick is officially out as Uber CEO, resigning from the company he co-founded. Kalanick's resignation comes just a week after the board announced he would take a leave of absence following months of scandals and employee exits. However, the pressure didn't come from the board. Instead, in a rare move, investors pushed Kalanick to step aside. After all, these investors have poured more than $15 billion into Uber, a company worth over $65 billion. Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde broke down the news with our Bloomberg tech reporter, Eric Newcomer, and Nime Mehta, partner at LeadEdge and an investor in Uber. Kalanick had hoped that the leave would satisfy his critics and would give him time to sort of recharge after you know, the death of his mother and sort of uh, somewhat sort of take responsibility for uh, the findings of the Holder inquiry. But um, then it clearly wasn't enough. Uh, Bill Gurley and some other major investors in Uber sort of uh, led this campaign to tell Travis that he needed to step aside, and that's looks to be what finally convinced him to leave the comp uh, to leave his position as CEO. And Nime, as an investor, this is something you agree with, is it? And why did it come down to the investor base, not the board? I think the investor base uh, represents a large voting interest of the company. And so that's an important um, uh, source of you know, uh, control and influence of the business. Um, I think it's important to recognize that Travis Kalanick also resigned, sort of prompted by this, but he's made the determination that this is actually the right thing for the company. He didn't have to resign. And so let's not discount you know, the role of Travis in making that decision for himself. And, and yes, prompted by the investors, but, but uh, he absolutely had a hand in it as well. Eric, can you explain to us potentially why the board hadn't taken such action prior to this? I mean, were their hands tied? Was it to do with Travis's own voting share? Well, Travis has a lot of control over the company, uh, especially when coupled with Garrett Camp, his co-founder, and Ryan Graves, an early employee and uh, an early CEO of the company. So together, they had a pretty strong coalition there. And then, I mean, I think there was a lot of faith in Travis. I mean, this is, he's been a key man in defining the company for good and bad. You know, Uber did 20 billion in gross bookings last year. I mean, amid all the scandals, it's easy to forget how enormous this business is, how global it is. So it will be a question how somebody else can step in and wrangle the business that Travis knows more than anyone else. Let's turn to Nime. I mean, now as an investor, are you as confident as ever that we can see the company continue to grow, we can see the valuation continue to be supported when they lose such a divisive visionary such as Travis? I think that uh, Travis's involvement or lack of involvement going forward is absolutely a challenge and it's something that the company's going to overcome. But there is plenty of precedent historically about non-founders stepping into the role of CEO and taking businesses forward. We look at Eric Schmidt at Google, albeit you know earlier in the life cycle of Google, but took over, took the reins and look at where Google is today. Um, not in the same facet, in the same uh, view, but you know when Steve Jobs passed away and took Tim Cook took the reins at Apple. I mean he's a founder and CEO, you know, uh, passed away, and and Apple is up 200 percent since uh, since uh, Steve Jobs passing. So there is absolutely precedent uh, for non-founders taking you know taking a back seat and businesses continuing to appreciate value and continue to do great things so uh, I, we're excited about who's going to step into those shoes they're big ones for sure uh, but there's lots of talented people out there that are excited about uh, taking on this opportunity taking on this challenge it's an incredible business like eric said they did 20 billion of bookings last year they continue to grow very quickly and uh, we continue that we continue to believe that that growth will will be sustained. They just need to have a uh, 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 the right leadership at the helm to um, to uh, continue that. 
Nemo, we're just looking at the amount of executives that need to be filled, the positions of CEO, COO, CFO, CMO, SVP of Engineering, General Counsel. <laughs> First of all, who do you envisage being CEO? Have you got any names that are springing to mind? Who is your Eric Schmidt in, in my, your mind's eye? My, my vote's definitely for Sheryl Sandberg. Uh, there isn't anybody, uh, and I don't know if she's going to take the job, but there isn't anybody that is more capable and uh, embodies the culture and values that the company needs on a go-forward basis. Uh, but uh, more generally speaking, they need someone with global experience, experience running a rapidly growing business as complex as, as Uber is, and someone that, again, embodies those, that's those values that um, they're looking to define on a go-forward basis, inclusion, empathy, these are the things that uh, the board and the investors are going to be looking for as they look to define a new CEO and fill out the rest of the operating bench. And can I quickly ask, therefore, how much you worry about the control Travis still continues to have from a voting share perspective, Nime? Going back to you know his resignation and him deciding to do that, I think that's the first step in a recognition that this is the right thing for the business. And from a governance and voting control standpoint, I think there's going to be uh, uh, steps taken going on a go-forward basis that help uh, create a little bit more balance and independence around the board. So we believe that those steps are are, are coming, and and that and that Travis will do the right thing from a governance standpoint. Let's not forget that that is also split between. Garrett and Ryan as well, and so there is um, there is some diversity there in in the in the voting control and, and ownership in the business, but that we should continue to see that uh, a diversification on a go forward basis as well. That was Bloomberg Tech's Eric Newcomer with Nime Meta, partner at Lead Edge, speaking with Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde. Facebook Chief Operating Officer Sheryl Sandberg led Facebook's presence at the annual CanLine Advertising Festival as the social network increasingly dominates the multi-billion dollar global ad market. But before she traveled to France, Sandberg spoke exclusively with Caroline Hyde and discussed the evolution of Facebook's ad strategy as the market shifts. Our biggest message is that the small screen is big. People have moved to mobile and businesses are catching up. It's now the case that the average U.S. consumer, and these numbers are duplicated all over the world, um, is spending about four hours a day on TV and five and three quarters on digital, the majority of which is mobile. And so it's a really exciting time to be a marketer because people are carrying around in their pockets this device that lets you reach them all of the time. And brands, product services, they've always been part of our daily life from the toothpaste we brush our teeth with to the shampoo we use to the car services or the cars we drive. All of this is part of our daily lives. But now marketers can reach us, hopefully, with messages we want to hear as part of our daily experience. That's pretty amazing. And the explosion of creativity, the Khan Advertising Festival is very much about the creative community. It's about how do we create messages that really resonate with people and that want them to be part of their daily lives. And this is almost playing into a discussion that Mark Zuckerberg himself started this year of community building. That's offline and online. But how are brands going to be able to play into that? Well, communities are so important. We're very focused on Facebook, from Mark and all of us, on how we build communities that provide support for people offline and online. Brands are a huge part of that. Airbnb is doing a great job. They have this great offline experience where people can rent house from hosts, but then they've created lots of Facebook groups that create online experiences. So even when you're not on that trip or not on that vacation, you can be connected to the people who are, be, who are part of it. And what about all the various products there for? I mean, you talk about how Airbnb is making a, a good run of it at the moment using Facebook groups, but what about Messenger? What about WhatsApp? What about Instagram? The portfolio that you have, how are these products being adopted and the growth you're seeing? In Facebook and Instagram, we have the two largest mobile ad platforms in the world, and we're seeing people really use that to build their businesses. There's a young woman in Brazil named Joanna. She started a company called Loha Namo, and their idea was to sell um, fashion accessories. So using Facebook and Instagram, they were able to, she did all of her advertising herself on her phone, and she was able to target those ads to people interested in fashion accessories. And 79% of the business she had came from Instagram. 
That's the small and local example. We also see the largest ad agencies, the largest clients in the world figuring out how to reach people and create creative that work for Facebook, for Instagram. And we're starting to learn a little bit more about how businesses can interact on Messenger as well. And what about video? This has, of course, been where the real explosion has been and what Facebook has really driven forward. You're experimenting with new ways in which adverts can come within videos that run on Facebook. How is that being adopted and, and how much are you starting to see that add to your bottom line? Marketers have always loved video because it's such a great way to tell a compelling story. And I think what this community is increasingly understanding and we need to do better is that you have to create the video for the platform. So the first TV ads were people reading their radio ads behind mics. Now, people could see, but when TV evolved, video ads were made for TV and it certainly wasn't someone sitting behind a mic. Similarly, a lot of the first video ads in a social space were 30 second TV spots just moved over to the social platform and, and those can work well. And therefore, is it an either or when you think of brands putting their money to work? I'm looking at data that says what $70 billion is currently spent on TV. How much of that will go purely to the digital space now? I don't think it's either or. Marketers should reach people on TV, they should reach people on mobile, they should reach people um, in the digital space, they should reach people everywhere they go. But how they reach people on all those different platforms needs to evolve. And Facebook and Instagram, we think we offer a really unique value proposition for marketers and people because you can have the creativity of a video, the creativity of sound and light and pictures, but you can also do very specific targeting. You can target your current customers differently than new customers, people who are in the market for a car, people who look like people in the market for a car, so you can make sure the right message gets to the right person. Coming up, tech's biggest titans gathered at the White House to discuss the road ahead for U.S. technology. We'll hear from Code for America's executive director, Jennifer Palka, who attended the meeting alongside Apple's Tim Cook and Microsoft's Satya Nadella. And later in the hour, more from our exclusive conversation with Facebook COO, Sheryl Sandberg. This is Bloomberg. A story we are following, the Federal Trade Commission is challenging the proposed merger between fantasy sports websites DraftKings and FanDuel. The FTC says the combined company would control 90% of the paid daily fantasy business, depriving customers of the benefits of direct competition between the two companies. The CEOs of both DraftKings and FanDuel said in a joint statement they're disappointed by the decision and considering their options. Tech leaders say the U.S. government needs to modernize after President Trump's senior advisor and son-in-law Jared Kushner held a tech summit at the White House on Monday. Apple CEO Tim Cook was just one of the tech titans in attendance, and he commended Kushner's steps in getting the government equipped with the latest technology. The U.S. should have the most modern government in the world, and today it doesn't. Uh, and it's great to see the effort that Jared is putting in, in working on things that will pay back in 5 and 10 and 20 years. We sat down with Jennifer Palka, Code for America founder and executive director. Palka attended the meeting in Washington and also served as the deputy chief technology officer under President Obama. <laughs> To the credit of the people who organized the meeting and the tech CEOs, there were breakout sessions um, on pretty substantive topics, um, things that people don't normally put on the news, like procurement reform and how to get the government into the cloud and digital services for citizens. And I saw that most of the tech executives actually went to the sessions that, that I was in and had a, you know, a pretty substantive dialogue about these, these issues. So you're walking into this having worked for the Obama administration. Give us some color from the room. What did it feel like? Well, again, to the credit of, of the folks there, um, it felt like the people who've come into the White House since Obama left have looked at what uh, I and many, many other colleagues did to say, this is how we're going to modernize government and said, yes, let's continue and accelerate that. Um, and I think that 
they're doing a good job of strengthening the United States Digital Service and the Technology Transformation Service, which are two units that absolutely do great tech for the American people. So uh, that's good. Um, I'm happy to see them doing that. They have a, a long way to go. On the other hand, they're doing this in the context of an administration uh, whose other actions don't necessarily represent uh, what's best for the American public if you're talking about services. Let's take a listen to what uh, Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella had to say to President Trump. Take a listen. All the technology that we have today is because it started, in fact, in the government and the research institutions you funded, as, as, as well as the enlightened immigration policy. Of course, I'm a beneficiary of that. And I hope that we continue uh, to be able to sort of really make sure that the American competitiveness is what helps us set policy for it. Immigration has been a hot topic for yes. President Trump. How did he respond to that remark? I don't recall what the president said to that remark. I also know that there was a lot more probably said behind closed doors. Mm. They had five breakout sessions per slot, and I was not in the one on, on immigration, though I was very glad to see it on the agenda. Did course. President Trump seem receptive? to what was discussed? President Trump certainly responded to those tech CEOs. Mm -hmm. um, I would really look, I think, more towards what the tech CEOs are saying to each other and how they're going to hold the president accountable, not just to the things that are about modernizing technology, but modernizing in the service of what? This should be in the service of services working for the American public, and they're going to have to stand up and ask those questions as this keeps going. Right. You posted ahead of this meeting and talked a little bit about why you were going and yes. said, politics aside, you know, why did you think it was important to be there, because, even if maybe you didn't agree with the politics? Right. Because there, there's politics and then there's governing, and governing is our problem. We have to get involved if it's going to work well. And I mean we as citizens, I mean we as Code for America, and I mean we as the tech industry. We're going to have to get more involved if we're going to make the, the business of governing work, the, the guts of it. It doesn't work well today. Try applying for food stamps, for instance. If you want to try to do it online, it's good that it's online, uh, until recently it's an almost an hour online, 50 screens, hundreds of questions, doesn't work on a mobile phone. You know, we've shown you can do that in seven minutes on a mobile phone, including uploading your documents. It's not just that that's a burden on the user, it means we get bad outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, food stamps, SNAP nationally, is one of the programs most highly correlated with better health and ed education outcomes for kids. So when we have half of our population in this state not on the program, half that could be on the program, we're missing out on all of those benefits that is going to cost us a lot more later when we have to intervene. As the former deputy uh, CTO, what are the biggest challenges they're going to run into when it comes to modernizing government? The biggest challenge they have right now is, is getting the talent that they need. There are amazing public servants already working in government, most of whom came under the previous administration, though a shout out to those who's come since and really said, you know, as one person rep replied to me on Twitter, um, I'm going in because, yes, it feels like, you know, uh, if our government has, is sort of a house on fire, I'm going to run towards that, not away from it. Um, those are great at public servants, and some will continue to go. There's also, you know, wonderful people who've been working in government to try to do this for so long. But we really need to keep that talent going, and it's harder to do it when, uh, when people don't agree with the policies of the administration. You started an organization called Code for America. Yes. This issue came up. Tim Cook uh, even spoke about it. What is the top of your priority list? For we're the trying, president. We're trying to prove that government services can work for all people equally with dignity, that, that government can work the way that it should in the 21st century. So we're there to reframe this conversation from modernizing to making it work for people. Mm -hmm. And I think that we can do that, um, not just by speaking up at meetings, but by following up and showing that it can work, and then asking everybody who works in tax to pay attention get involved, support government when it's doing the right thing, and hold it accountable when it's not. That was Jennifer Palka, Code for America founder and executive director. Coming up, Tesla goes global, the company ramping up its presence in, in China with an agreement to produce cars in the country. And later, Blue Apron announces details of its IPO plans just as the food startup scene was thrown through a loop. On the Amazon Whole Foods deal, we'll break down how the competition in food delivery is heating up. This is Bloomberg.
Tesla has signed a preliminary agreement to explore production in China. According to people familiar with the matter, the electric car maker reached the deal with the city of Shanghai. It would move Tesla a step closer to lowering its manufacturing and shipping costs in the world's largest auto market. Bloomberg first reported this story on Monday with our Bloomberg Tech reporter Dana Hall, who covers Tesla. Well, it sounds like there's an imminent announcement for Tesla to produce vehicles in Shanghai. And we're hearing this from China. Uh, not a lot of details yet on who the JV partner would be, but this would be a huge move for Tesla as it seeks to become a global automaker. Right now, they just have one auto plant here in California. So how significant is this? It's pretty significant because right now, American auto companies can't really make cars in China unless they have a local production partner. And without that, uh, the import taxes are prohibitively high. And having a local partner in China to produce with would allow Tesla to access China, where luxury cars are all the rage. How big a market do we think China could be for Tesla? It could be pretty significant. We're already seeing signs that sales of the Model X are doing really well there. You know, they came out with the X with this HEPA filter for climate control. And in the wake of the Paris Agreement, China is the leader on climate change, especially when it comes to autos. Elon Musk tweeted over the weekend also that there are two upcoming SpaceX launches. What can you tell us about those? Yes. So uh, their next launch is Bulgaria Sat, which is a communication satellite. That launch has shifted around a little bit, uh, but is now scheduled for Friday from Cape Canaveral in Florida. Then on Saturday, Saturday, they're going to um, launch satellites for Iridium from Vandenberg Air Force Base. So they could potentially have two back-to-back -back launches from either coast. What is the significance of these coming launches given the challenges that SpaceX has had? Yeah, I think what you're really seeing is that SpaceX has kind of come back from the mishap of last September and they're launching rockets on a more regular basis. Their goal is to launch 20 to 24 rockets this year and if they hit that, that would be a pretty incredible launch cadence. So talk to us about then what we're expecting. Well, we're just expecting two launches. I mean, launches can shift a lot because of last minute technical issues or because of weather. They have to get permission from the Air Force. But if they launch one rocket from Florida on Friday and then another rocket from California on Saturday, that, that's, I mean, that's pretty unprecedented. So, so put it in the big picture for us when it comes to the space race, the private space race, as it were, and SpaceX's role within it? Well, SpaceX is really focused on driving down the cost of space, and reusing rockets is a big part of that. So they had a big milestone in March where they reused a rocket for the first time. They're going to reuse one of the rockets again this weekend, and they're just going to be launching rockets on a more regular basis. The more they launch, the cheaper it gets as they reuse their boosters. Our Bloomberg Tech reporter, Dana Hull there. Well, Airbnb is on the verge of launching a premium service aimed at attracting customers who like fancy hotels. According to people familiar with the project, the service will send inspectors into hosts' homes to make sure they meet a set of quality standards. The new Airbnb program could launch by the end of the year. Coming up, more of our exclusive conversation with Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg, her thoughts on combating terror online and solving tech's diversity problem. And a reminder that all episodes of Bloomberg Technology are now live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to the best of Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. We return now to our exclusive conversation with Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg. The social networking giant recently announced it would increase usage of artificial intelligence to help remove extremist content as European leaders put more pressure on tech companies to block material. Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde spoke with Sandberg about this issue. There's no place for any of this content on Facebook, no place for hate, no place for violence, no place for terrorism. And we take that responsibility very seriously. We just announced last week, we've been working on this for a long time, we're going to continue to work on it. But we announced some really important next steps we're taking. We're using AI as a technology to help us find 
any content that may be inappropriate and get it off even faster. We're making a big human resource investment. We already have researchers and law enforcement experts and terrorism experts who work at Facebook, but we're growing that, as well as our human review capacity. We have about 4,500 people around the world who review content to remove inappropriate content, and we're growing that by 3,000, so that's a very significant investment. We're also working with nonprofits, governments, other companies around the world to make sure that we all work together to make sure that this content, you know, is not on our platforms. For brands, we offer a lot of tools for brands to know where their ads can show to make sure that they know that Facebook is a safe community for them. You say that you're working with not-for-profits, with governments. How, how have you perhaps in Europe, for example, been talking with governments? Have you had to about this as yet? Are you worried about the, the talk about encryption and, and some of the fines that have been raised? We're in constant conversation with governments on issues of security and issues that affect all of us working together. We've worked with governments um, to talk about initiatives we call the OCCI, so online mm -hmm. content initiatives, where governments can not just make sure terrorism is prevented, but can actually do counterterrorism work, try to get positive messages out there that stop people from from doing things that obviously hurt so many people. We also work with law enforcement officials all over the world to make sure that if there's if there's anything we can do to support their work, um, we're able to do it in this area. That was something fascinating that you launched in Berlin. It was the online civil courage initiative, an innovative use of using counter narrative. This is so complex, as I mentioned, and therefore, how do you think you can understand if you are improving? What's the end goal or target? Is it to ensure that the measurements come down and the numbers come down? What will you count as success, dare I ask? Well, success from a company point of view is to make sure there is no inappropriate content of any kind hate, violence, terrorism, any of this on our platform. But we take our responsibility even more broadly than that. We want to contribute. So for example, over the past several years, tech companies have started working together, sharing information very freely. When anyone identifies someone they think is going to put inappropriate content on a platform, we know that we have a broad responsibility here to do everything we can in the face of some of these threats to help protect people. And we take that very seriously. And have brands so far, even though, of course, we're in early days, have brands responded positively, not only on the terrorism element, but also the fake news? They feel that this is changing? Yes. Brands know that Facebook's a safe place for them to be. We've worked very hard to make sure that inappropriate content's not on Facebook and that brands have a safe way and a contextually safe way to communicate on Facebook. I think what's also fascinating, you talk very passionately about this element. You also have been someone who talks constantly, passionately about diversity. And this is something that we're seeing now brands also become potentially involved in. What are your messages to brands as to how to keep on drawing diversity and ensure we have a balanced view, not only within companies, but also in advertising? Brands have such an important role to play here because people see so many marketing messages. The estimates are that people can see hundreds of marketing messages a day. That means that if we market products and services, so in a supportive of gender equality way, supporting female leadership, supporting men as caregivers, we can really make strides towards gender, gender equality in the world. The Can Lion Foundation will announce the Glass Lion, and that's something we worked with them, my foundation Lean In, to establish a few years ago. And it's award given every year at Can to the ads of the year which are best for gender equality. Last year, P&G won for an ad called Share the Load, which showed a man watching his daughter doing all the housework in her home, realizing he never helped his wife, her mother, and leaving her house and going home to his wife of many decades and offering to do laundry. And diversity closer to home then. Talk to us about diversity in Silicon Valley. If I'm a female looking at getting a job in technology at the moment, I look at one big brand, I look at Uber, for example, and maybe I'm being put off. What advice as a COO might you give to Uber and what advice would you give to those people wanting to get into technology right now as a female? 
Well, obviously, the reports of what's happening at Uber are super troubling, and I'm glad that they are taking action to address them, and all of us need to do more. We definitely need more women and underrepresented minorities in the tech field. We also need them in leadership in every industry in the world. We have these same issues. In technology, we have a special both concern and opportunity, which is that women are not studying computer science. In 1985, women were 35 percent of computer science degrees, and now we're down to 17 or 18 percent. But we know that girls are outperforming boys in school in most countries in the world, including yours, including mine, all the way from elementary school through university. And so we need to persuade our daughters and people of underrepresented minorities that tech is for them. Meal kit delivery company Blue Apron said it's targeting $3.2 billion valuation for its public offering. Details of its IPO announcement come after shares of grocers and retailers fell on the news that Amazon is planning to buy Whole Foods in a whopping $13 billion deal. We discussed the current food tech landscape with our Bloomberg editor-at-large, Corey Johnson, and Bloomberg News IPO reporter, Alex Barinka. This is a company that operates in a space we know that food delivery is so fueled by competition. It's an expensive space to operate in because so much of the costs do go to marketing. You're always fighting, uh, it's kind of a land grab out there for wallet share for, cons for customers. This is especially tricky for Blue Apron in that Whole Foods will now potentially have uh, the logistical empire that is Amazon, and Amazon customers will have more access to Whole Foods. Why is that important? Because those are the kind of high earner customers, the top 10%, let's say, of U.S. households who are willing to spend uh, a little bit more to get the quality that Whole Foods promises. Well, that kind of happens to be the same group that Blue Apron is targeting. I spoke to an analyst earlier today who said, look, they're all fighting for the same wallet share here of these high spending customers. It's going to be hard for Blue Apron to fight down the value chain because, frankly, folks are just not willing to spend $11, $12 a plate uh, for a box of fresh food, granted, but that might spoil. So so when you think about uh, where Blue Apron's growth is going to be, they're going to have to figure out how to make sure that they are the ones nabbing those dollars from those high-end consumers and not uh, Whole Foods via Amazon. And yet, Corey, Blue Apron, a very different business from Whole right. Foods, Amazon. How does that really change the competitive landscape? I mean, look, Whole Foods and Blue Apron are very different businesses. Yes, they serve food to consumers, but that's sort of where the similarities and a certain type of consumer at a certain price point. What you see Blue Apron doing is trying to market really aggressively, because this is a new kind of idea, sending people just the amount of food that they need to make for a certain meal with that recipe and delivering it on a regular basis. Uh, and they're spending vast fortunes to do it. You know, Alex mentioned their, their marketing costs. They spent over $60 million just last quarter, $61 million last quarter. Look how much they're spending every quarter in advertising. And as a percentage of revenues, it's going way up. It was 25% of revenues last quarter. It's just an extraordinary amount of money to be spending on marketing. Uh, that certainly will help them in their IPO because now the name is better known. But they really are just spending like crazy, like drunken sailors, to try to get people into their service. Uh, the goal, of course, is not just get them in, but to keep them. And they have yet to show that ability. Alex, almost every analyst we speak to says to expect more consolidation in this space. Could Blue Apron consider M&A or reconsider the timing? Well, right now we've got uh, only uh, about nine days left for M&A to be on the table. This deal is scheduled to price next week. So that would have to happen. I mean, frankly, given um, where it is in the cycle of this deal, if something like that was going to happen, it probably would have already. What I can tell you is a person familiar with the deal uh, spoke to me and told me that management is focusing on refining its IPO pitch. They're really pushing uh, this lifestyle idea that Corey was talking about, how it's so different, the fact that it's recipes and prepackaged ingredients, and that that's so different than uh, what a grocery delivery company does. And they'll be really pushing toward addressable market, not just the fact that they can expand, but also only about 1% of all grocery shopping actually happens online. So these are areas that, you know, frankly, Amazon Whole Foods could help if people get uh, more used to buying their food off the internet. But this is seems to be uh, an IPO for sure at this point but I will definitely be keeping an eye on it. Corey, we've got new reporting out that uh, about actually how this Amazon Whole Foods right. deal will actually work. 
job cuts at Whole Foods, price cuts at Whole Foods. What can you tell us? So Amazon denies uh, the job cuts, but we have other sources saying that that's going to happen. Um, I, I think you know the Amazon style has been to do things at a very, very low margin. Half the margin, as, as bad as grocery margins are, Whole Foods is about a 5% operating margin. Kroger has about a 2% operating margin. Amazon's even worse. Or, but I think that that's really not, you know, the, the focus for Amazon in most of its business lines, Amazon Web Services is very different. But Amazon's overall profit margins are below 2%. They want lots of cash flow and use that cash flow to reinvest in their business. So they're not really looking for the very things that uh, Whole Foods uh, um, activist shareholders are looking for. Increase those operating margins. Don't look for Amazon to do that. Coming up, Airbnb rolling out a new feature to help combat the global refugee crisis. We'll hear from co-founder Joe Gabbia next. This is Bloomberg. Airbnb is outlining ambitious plans to use its platform to help refugees and evacuees around the globe on its new open homes platform. The goal? To find housing for 100,000 displaced people in the next five years. We heard from Susan Wynn Bailey, an Airbnb host from Denver, who's hosted several refugee families over the last few months. She explained why she decided to sign up for the program. When I first was contacted by Airbnb asking if we could host a refugee in need, um, it was just an unequivocal yes. Uh, it's consistent with our values um, as a family, and quite honestly, it aligns with, I think, the broader vision and mission of Airbnb, which is to serve those in need. And we spoke with Airbnb co-founder Joe Gebbia, who made a new announcement about the platform from Paris on how the company is trying to get many more people like Susan signed up for this program. You can imagine over the last five years, we've seen incredible growth of our, our host community. And it really begged this question, what if we became proactive about situations in the world rather than just reactive to natural disasters? And so pretty quickly, the topic of displaced people came front and center to us. Currently, there's 65 million displaced people. Uh, that's the most since World War II. It also happens to be close to the population of the United Kingdom. So as we looked at what is Airbnb really good at, short-term hospitality, engendering trust between strangers and global presence, we thought we might extend this natural generosity into a platform that we're calling Open Homes. You call this 21st century philanthropy. Why are you doing this? I feel like we have a responsibility. We have this incredible asset, this amazing community of over 3 million homes in 191 countries. And I think it's, it's really, you know, uh, looking around in the world of, of how we might apply what we're good at with where it's needed the most, this to us makes a lot of sense. You're a $31 billion company. You've got investors who've placed huge, be huge bets on your future. How do you sell them on the idea that this is worth devoting time and resources to from a business perspective? Well, you know, I think that this is really just a natural extension of, of what we're already doing. And it, it really is the question of why not provide the same solution we do to travelers as those who are displaced? How does this benefit the business of Airbnb? Does it be benefit the business financially? Well, Airbnb does not take any transactions on these kinds of connections. This is all about generosity and hospitality in times of need. Um, and, you know, I think it's just, it's a part of our business. Certainly, you know, we have a great core business that is able to fund this sort of thing. Um, but to us, this is just an extension of, of the values of our company coming to life in the real world. What happens when there's a problem, for example, when a host and a guest don't get along, or maybe there's a, a cultural clash? Well, we partner very closely with third-party agencies that are well-respected. They've been doing this for many, many years. And we work very closely with them and provide the same customer service that we do when you use a regular product as well. Airbnb was hosting a massive convention for its hosts in November 2015 uh, when the Paris terror attacks happened. You were there. Uh, there is a very divisive debate going on around the world right now uh, around immigration and terrorism. There's talk of closing borders and building walls. How do you respond to that? You know, I think if anything right now, the world could use a little more understanding of each other. And if that's something that we can do through our platform by allowing people to open their homes to those who need it the most, then we're, we're happy to play that part. Tech leaders are making critical decisions right now about how to work with the U.S. presidential administration. Uh, we've seen some tech leaders drop off presidential councils, for example, when they've disagreed with 
President Trump on climate change. What is Airbnb's strategy when it comes to working or not working with the White House, even on issues you disagree on? Well, you know, we see home sharing as a nonpartisan issue. We work with Democrats and Republicans alike. And so, you know, we'll work with, with any administration, Democrat or Republican, to bring home sharing to life. Airbnb is expanding with this open homes platform. You're also adding more experiences uh, to the platform instead of just places to stay. Give us an update on the business and plans for an IPO. <laughs> Well, from a business standpoint, we're really excited because in 2016, we launched Trips, which allows anyone to offer an experience and really answer that question, what can I do? Now that you helped me discover a really local part of a city, how can I find out the cool and interesting things to do? And through experiences, it allows our hosts uh, on Airbnb to share their skills, talents, or passions and allow any outsider to feel like an insider when traveling. Now, Joe, Airbnb has three very involved co-founders, and as the company has grown uh, and moves forward, how do you distinguish your role and what are your top priorities? Well, I think each of us is nicely settled into what our passions are and what's most valuable to the company. Uh, I certainly enjoy thinking about the future, um, and I run a design studio inside the company called Samara, which is an R&D team, and in fact is where the origins of the Open Home platform began. Um, of thinking about how we might utilize Airbnb's core competencies to put a dent in this really global problem. Coming up, Jack Ma plays his Trump card. The Alibaba founder delivers on a promise made to the president to create one million jobs in the United States, starting with small businesses in Detroit. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. Alibaba is pulling out all the stops for U.S. business entrepreneurs. The e-commerce giant held a two-day event in Detroit, Michigan this week, drawing in thousands of small business owners aiming to learn how to succeed in China with the company's help. For the company's founder and executive chairman, Jack Ma, it's following through on a promise he made to President Trump to create one million jobs earlier this year. We discussed Alibaba's plans with Brian Buckwald, co-founder and CEO of Bomoda, and Brian Nider, a partner at Lead Edge Capital, which includes Alibaba, in its portfolio. I think it's great what they're doing. I think that they're really trying to get out to American businesses, both small business owners, uh, farmers and agriculturalists, as well as uh, larger brands, and they're trying to educate them, number one, on what the opportunities are in China, which are massive, and number two, get them sort of signed up on the Alibaba platform to say, look, you've been selling in North America for a really long time or in Western Europe for a really long time, but there's so much opportunity over here in China and the economy is growing so much, you should bring some business over here and you should start exporting here. And there's a lot of Chinese consumers over the last 10 years with the rise of the middle class that, that, that are looking for really interesting uh, products that are produced here in America. And it's a, it's a great potential marriage. Brian Buckwald, is the demand actually there? That, that, that's a good question. I'd almost separate the, the demand from the supply. I do think that there is a demand in China for American goods. We've seen that repeatedly. The question is, where will that supply come from? I, I do think this. This conference is, is great marketing. It's, it's strong politically when you think about Beijing as well as Washington, D.C., and playing to both constituencies. As a matter of practicality, I don't know how many of these small businesses <coughs> will be successfully selling on Alibaba within the next two to three years. However, there is certainly a demand by Chinese consumers for foreign goods. Brian Neider, what do you make of that as an Alibaba investor? Look, I think that they have to position themselves for the long term, no doubt, right? So maybe within the next six or 12 months, uh, they don't have as many uh, US-based sellers selling on their platform. But this is a long-term play. And when we think about modeling out the business and, and where we get excited is, what could they do over the next three, five, 10 years? And so if you look at some of the projections that they made, and, and, and many of them were, were pretty ambitious from their analyst day two weeks ago in China, they were talking about doing a um, you know, trillion dollars in gross merchandise value through their platform by the year 2020. That's three years from now. And I think that certainly some help that they could get from American suppliers would, would help them reach that goal. So I become very excited, and I'd agree with, with, with my counterpart here that, that most certainly it might take a little bit of time, but over the long term, I think that, that this is certainly an opportunity for the company to capitalize upon. Your counterpart, the other Brian, Brian Buckwald, <laughs> Jack Ma promised he would create a million jobs in the U.S. Can he deliver on that promise? 
Uh, if we're looking at a 100-year time frame, I, I think he could, Emily. <laughs> I, I, I don't think so over the next three to five years. I think the, the math doesn't, doesn't really work in his favor. Um, that being said, uh, there's a lot of trade that can obviously happen on, on Taobao and on Tmall. And what, what Jack is really doing here is he's trying to open up the U.S. market to Alibaba more, uh, more prodigiously than it has been. He's trying to get the brand in front of more small businesses, but more importantly, he's trying to make it more acceptable in the eyes of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and other groups who have been, to a certain extent, um, battling out with Alibaba and, and some of the issues they've had regarding, for instance, counterfeits. Now, Amazon made big news by agreeing to buy Whole Foods. Alibaba has interestingly been investing in grocery uh, for several years now. Uh, Brian Neider, do you see Alibaba and Amazon now clashing on a new battle line? Uh, to some extent, maybe, but they're doing this in, in very different geography. They're doing this in very different geographies. So, you know, when you look at what Alibaba is doing, it's primarily in China, obviously. I don't think Amazon has any uh, um, plans to get in there, though who knows. Um, and, and, and Amazon's takeover of Whole Foods certainly will, will make for a lot of interesting uh, dynamics, but I don't necessarily think that, that, that they're competitive head to head. I think that probably they're learning from one another's strategies, and you see that across the board. They've gotten into uh, uh, payments, each of them, they've gotten into media, each of them, they've gotten into um, uh, uh, cloud. And so, you know, certainly they're learning from each other, but they don't directly compete in the same geography, so it's a little bit hard to say. Brian Buckwald, there have long been concerns about Alibaba and Amazon clashing more broadly. Will that ever come to fruition or no because of the geographic limitations? Well, well certainly uh, Amazon has had ambitions in, in, in entering China more aggressively and, and they've looked for different paths in as Alibaba has looked to move out of China. Um, Alibaba has found probably greater success looking at um, rest of Asia and, and other non-call it US centric markets. Um, that being said, if, if you look at what, what Alibaba is doing, it's taking more of the Walmart approach. They're looking at more, more mass brands, their investments in companies like Sanyang, their partnership with um, Shanghai Balian Group have been much more about discount uh, marketers, uh, large scale supermarkets, not really the whole foods of the world. Also, Alibaba at the heart of it is a marketplace, whereas Amazon is really the retailer taking principal risk. You can almost see Amazon succeeding on Alibaba with Whole Foods selling into China more so than the two of them really competing in China, I think, at least in the near term. I just don't think that Amazon is the competitor that a Tencent, for instance, is for Alibaba in China right now. Brian Neider, as an investor in Alibaba, do you, do you feel a threat from Amazon? I mean, certainly not in, in, in the core China market. There's a lot of other companies that are doing well in China. And like Brian said, uh, you know, certainly Tencent and JD.com are, are the ones that come to mind in their core retail business. But you know, to date, Amazon hasn't really played there to the extent that Alibaba wants to move into the U.S. and is trying to bring U.S.-based sellers to sell goods and services uh, uh, into China, let's say. I could see there be becoming a little bit of overlap. But to this point, no, not really, just again, because of that geographical diversification. They learn from each other more than they compete with one another. And that does it for this edition of the Best of Bloomberg Technology. Be sure to tune in next week for my exclusive interview Tuesday with Kirsten Green, founder of Forerunner Ventures. And remember, all episodes of Bloomberg Technology are live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays. That's all for now. This is Bloomberg.